My name is Alexander. I'm one of the volunteer co-organizers of Data Council KL, and I'll be your MC for tonight. Uh, before we start, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, my fellow volunteer co-organizers, um, Ayas, Hazik, Ayas, Hazik, Ash, and um, other Data Council champion members. Uh, and volunteers and pretty much anyone you see wearing uh, these, these, data council, these cool data council t-shirts for making tonight's event possible. <clears throat> so this event is being live, live streamed and recorded uh, thanks to equipment on loan to us from engineers.my. Let's give a hand to engineers.my. Thank you engineers.my. Um, do check them out and you can check out the live stream on the engineers.my YouTube channel. So. Oops. Uh, just work quick. Oh. It's not working. No, move the. Sorry, move the mic. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh. I'm pointing it. It's not working. Okay, this, this next. okay, so sorry about that technical difficulties. Um, right. So here's a quick run through of tonight's agenda. I'll briefly talk about what is Data Council. Then I'll talk about uh, our TDD segment, also known as the Data Dump, which is uh, a curated selection of resources that we think um, the local data community should be aware of and can learn from. Then after that, on to our main event, the talks for tonight, um, which would then be followed by a quick uh, job pitch segment where anyone looking to hire or looking to be hired can pitch themselves on stage for one minute and then we will end for the night. So, uh, next. Um, before we proceed, uh, the reality is without our sponsors, uh, we won't be able to host conducive uh, knowledge sharing meetups just like this. So tonight's venue has actually been, uh, tonight's venue and food has been so graciously sponsored by Money Lion. Thank you, Money Lion. So I would like to invite uh, Benny Leong, Director of AI Engineering, and Rodika Belukosov, Director of Human Resources for Money Lion Malaysia, to the stage to say a few words about Money Lion. So, as we have benefited 
invented through all the kind of meetups, be the knowledge uh, that we have gained through all the sharing or the connections that we have made with you that lead to a good friendship or even a partnership. It's a big at money line that it is very important for us to continue to give back to our local tech community. So do we look forward to a lot more events organized or co-hosted by Moneyline in the future here in Malaysia? So I believe that it is true all this kind of semi-formal exchange of knowledge and activities that will allow us to quickly elevate uh, not just our staff at Moneyline but also the entire community as well. So it's a win-win situation. Uh, to demonstrate our level of commitment, I would actually want to give a quick shout out to one of our co-founders, Mr. Fong Chi Man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, thank you, Chief, for taking some time off your busy schedule to join us today. And you know, right now, let's like, hand over to Ms. Rodika to talk to you about you know team that you have in mind line and what you can do if you're interested in joining us or just want to find out more about us. Right? Thank you. Thanks, for arranging this amazing meetup. Um, I'm Rodica, as you already know. I'm leading the HR marketing team here at Moneyline Payout. Um, so my main goal is actually to help the business grow while hiring for the right talent. Um, at the same time, to make sure that the existing talent is happy. Um, when it comes to hiring, uh, two things I would like to add to what Benny said before. The payout process is basically the backup for, for for money line is the biggest team that we have in all four offices. We are at the moment, at the moment 130 plus at least here. So when it comes to hiring, what we are looking for is mainly the back profile, both on the front end career side, but also AI, data science, and data engineering. Now, if any of you is um, looking for a challenge, if any of you want to help us grow and rewire the banking industry, um, and if any of you want to work in an office that has unlimited CPO, vacation allowance, that's 300, I'm here. So I will be um, looking forward to talk to as many of you as possible. However, we will also be sending an email with the link, we'll be opening the guys to speak to make a nice and more conversation. Um, thank you a lot again, and I wish you all a great time and enjoy the topic with some speakers. <laughs> Thank you, Benny and Rodica. Uh, and thank you, Moneyline, once again. Um, so moving on, a bit about Data Council. So what is Data Council? Um, data Council, so Data Council is the first community-powered data science and analytics event for software engineers, data scientists, deep learning researchers, and technical founders who want to discover tools and insights to build AI-based products. So, um, one of the things that, that Data Council prides themselves on is being uh, taking a no bullshit approach to running data events and communities. So if you think we aren't living up to this mantra, do let us know, we value your feedback and we want to stay true to our principles. Um, so Data Council actually hosts a number of global events. The most recent one was the most recently concluded one was in Barcelona, Spain, and in fact, they were having another one in New York just next week. And there are a number of community chapters around the world, with Data Council KL being one of them. We want Data Council KL to be the meetup group where data professionals from around KL can gather together to network and to share technical insights with each other and advance our industry as a whole. So next up, we will have the data dump segment. So uh, first off, we'll be, yeah, so um, I thought this was quite an interesting article, which is, can be found on this online team magazine called The Gradient, that was founded by um, students and researchers of the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. So in this article, they basically talked about the state of machine learning frameworks in the year 2019. And uh, some interesting, so this graph here actually shows a comparison of uh, PyTorch versus TensorFlow in terms of uh, unique mentions in journal papers. 
Um, so the, 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 what was interesting in this article was uh, they found that PyTorch appears to be dominating the academic and research space, but TensorFlow, at least for now, still seems to be dominating in production use cases. So the article itself actually discusses like reasons why this is so, and actually talks about the future for both frameworks. So uh, if you're curious about uh, all of this, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, the next one is a new free web book by Chart.io called Cloud Data Management. Uh, so Chart.io is a software as a service uh, a dashboarding and visualization provider. Um, so they've created this book uh, which is actually seen as a spiritual successor to these two classics. Uh, but because these books were, were written like so long ago, they felt that we needed uh, some more modern material. And I think this, this, this book is actually aimed at those who are looking to move from doing analytical queries directly on their production databases to starting to build their own data lake and data marts. So it's worth to check out. And I thought another interesting feature here as well is that they actually uh, uploaded the whole book on uh, GitHub. So you can actually submit your own pull requests to help uh, improve the content further. So next, I will pass on to my colleague, Hazik. Yeah. No need to click, you just pass it on. Yeah, just hold on. Yeah. Uh, I think it's what? Ash. Ash. All right, cool. Uh, hey, guys. Okay. So I'll be covering three topics for today. <laughs> so the first one will be about BI tools enhancing analytics. So if you notice, there's been a few announcements by tools like Tableau and Power BI where they started integrating machine learning into their tools straight away, right? So it seems that there's going to be a transition where all these tools will start taking over all parts of the modeling and enabling also have the tools. So we're going to start seeing a position where I suppose to pure coding and then figuring out about algorithms will be more about it will be more about thinking about the problem clearer clear and the actual data engineering and taking together. So even though it's always a big problem, right? Having the right data to actually plot your relations. So the tools are now getting there. So it'll be more about the ability for them to think through the problem and arrive at I thought this can actually go through the solution. Uh, next. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the second article I'm going to be covering is about choosing charts I don't understand. So you know that we seem to have a bit of an obsession with choosing the most complicated charts that nobody understands. So sort of like mm, collective drone right there. So you know, honestly, there's a lot of ways to communicate information, and generally, complex sets are more used for exploring information as opposed to communicating the information here. So, this uh, article talks about this and explains a bit of when and where you should use complex charts and when you should, should when you should use maybe simpler charts like line charts and bars to strengthen uh, what the whole chart or something like that. Uh, right, and the last one is just uh, me sharing the resource. I don't know if you've heard about free for dev. So basically, this is a website slash GitHub repo which stores resources that are free for developers. Uh, they will, the requirements are a free year, or if it's only a free trial period, the trial period has to be a minimum of one year before you can go on the site. So in case you're actually developing or you want to find tools that you can use without coughing up a lot of money, it will look for free for that. The link will be when you in the site when we share it over. So I'm going to pass it to all right okay so oh no you can just tell it yeah all right so uh next up so when we use data right sometimes most of the case study that we see Look, look, uh, look and read online is all based on like companies or startups doing it. But what about institutions? So institutions such as the um, international. So what I have here is uh, it's a news uh, on a research conducted by the International Mon uh, Monetary Fund. So what they're using is that they're trying to use unconventional data sources to measure economic activities. So. Okay, you know, economic activities, traditionally, you use things like GDP um, and conduct surveys to kind of like find out that how the economy is doing. 
But when there is a lack of data, there's a lack of official statistics, especially in developing countries like um, uh, countries in Africa, for example. So what researchers in IMF found is that they can use unconventional data sources. So like in this example, they actually use um, or, yeah. So they actually use um, satellite images to see the nightlight intensity. So and from the nightlight intensity, they can see which um, areas are growing across the years and what sort of like is there inequality um, in uh, this happening inequality in development happening in country. So yeah, it's pretty cool because rarely we get to see like how uh, institution is using their data. So next. All right. So um, as a data scientist uh, working in Malaysia, um, especially we're dealing with languages, right? You find out that a lot of like toolkits and resources available are online is on English or languages that we that doesn't support Malay, our national language. So this is an actually an open source um, natural language toolkit for Bahasa Malaysia. Um, one of the few um, that I knew uh, that I know of, if not the only that I know of. So here, uh, Malaya is called the, the the package is called Malaya, and it has Bahasa Bahasa pre-trained model. Um, and you can see some of the um, performance here. And good news, the person who built Malaya is right here with us. Here, his name is Hussein. He's right at the front seat. So if you have any questions on like how to use and how does he, how did he build it and whatnot, the technical details, please. He's right here, man. He's right here. All right. Um, right. Then I'll pass on to. Hello. So uh, my article is more about exactly that, coding habits for data scientists. So when I was in uh, one of the conferences, uh, I met this guy from ThoughtWorks. He was a software developer there, software engineer. And uh, he was his job was basically productionizing or helping a data scientist, uh, what do you call this? Productionize their workloads. So what he was sharing, and this is the article from him, he was sharing basically bad software engineering practices that uh, data scientists lack in their normal day-to-day, -day, uh, let's say, EDA, or when they actually build their models, stuff like that. So it, it goes into some detail. For example, I'm not sure if you guys can see it, but he shows what usually people do and what they should do. And also, this is sort of the cycle. Like, normally people will get a Jupyter notebook, and then they're like, I need to deploy this. And then that's the flow that usually happens. And then this is the refactoring cycle is what he talks about a lot and how to uh, have less pain when you refactor things. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so you can check out this article if, uh, if that's something that you're doing right now. Right. Okay, and I'll take up the last two. So, uh, hi, my name is Ash. I'm, uh, I put in slides sometimes. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, these are two things that I thought were really cool. So the first one is, um, this is actually more high level, I would say. So uh, just now you heard a lot more about like how do you do data science as a, a data scientist. This is more towards kind of if you're running a data science team or if you're going to start a data science team in your company. So uh, there's three article links that I put down there. Of course, the slides will be shared later, so you can uh, check out the links later as well. Um, but fundamentally, it comes from Sequoia Data. And then there's one from Stitch Fix about beware, you know, like um, splitting data scientists, data people by function. So you don't want to have like a group of data scientists who then throw their models over to a group of data engineers who then, you know, like um, productionize it and then throw over to a group of data, uh, I don't know, SREs. You kind of want people who handle the whole flow ideally so that they have a better, uh, vi vis a better vision of the whole um, life cycle. And also, finally, like some other companies and how they structure the data teams. So uh, HubSpot's uh, data team is pretty interesting. The data in that article actually, so they cover like how many percent of the people in the company uh, are involved in analytics. So uh, definitely an article, a good article to check out as well. And the uh, last one is a personal favorite. So uh, anyone here from a software engineering background probably heard of the Joel test before. So it's a list of 12 steps, uh, 12 kind of questions you can ask a company to kind of know like what their engineering experience is like. So these are things like, is hallway usability testing done? You know, uh, is there a coding challenge for new hires? 
So uh, I really like this one, uh, which was actually shared by IS, which is the data science Joel test. So we'll go through a couple of key ones, right? Can new hires get set up in the environment to run analyses on the first day? Now, uh, I'd be very curious to know how many people here who are in their, data, their company's data team, if you're a new hire, can you actually get set up with your laptop and start doing analyses on your first day? Uh, can data scientists use the latest tools or packages without help from IT? Do you have admin access on your laptop? You know, can you actually install, if you want to pip install a new package, can you do that without having to go to IT and submit a ticket that then takes two weeks to come back? Right? Can data scientists use on-demand and scalable compute resources if your model suddenly needs to take, uh, you know, needs four hours longer than you, would ex uh, than you would normally want to, right? You want to bump the machine up to the next instance. Can you do that or do you need to also call up IT and submit a ticket? Uh, can data scientists find and reproduce past experiments? Uh, does collaboration happen through a system other than email? I added WhatsApp because I know Malaysian companies really love collaboration over WhatsApp. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but does collaboration happen over a platform that is more conducive to code or to data, right? Um, can predictive models be deployed to production without custom engineering or infrastructure work? Can you train a model and then push and then it's in production? Uh, and finally, do your data scientists use the best tools money, that money can buy? So uh, these are really great questions I think that you should ask if you're joining a data team or if you run a data team, these are questions you should be asking yourself. Uh, and how can you enable those? Uh, yeah, so that's all for me. Thanks. Yeah. So we just want to give a quick shout out to other local communities out there as well. There's DevOps Mind, there's the AWS User Group, Kuala Lumpur JS, and uh, many others. And I think it is important as a member of uh, the local tech community to kind of support each other. So uh, this is just a quick shout out to all of them. Um, yeah. Yeah. There are many more tech meetups in KL. Okay. So before we dive into the talk tonight we want to let everyone know that uh, we we want and value your feedback so you can provide it to us via this link bit.ly slash WTF data council tree so that's bit.ly slash WTF data council tree or you can scan this QR code here and uh, we hope that you give us your feedback on this event um, as for speaker slides uh, they will be made available shortly after uh, the event tonight on our meetup page. So if you would like uh, access to the slides, uh, you just need to make sure that you are signed up on our meetup page. Um, yeah, so without further ado, now on to the main event. I'd like to invite uh, Saw Season, the Director of Data Engineering at uh, Money Lion. To give to present his talk, uh, Apache Spark: Various Ways of Running a Spark Job. Oh, I can just carry. Yeah, it may be awkward for you. Is it? Okay. okay. This is a clicker. Right. Yeah. So just put it in your pocket. And it's easier. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, hi guys. I never hear myself so loud before. <laughs> okay. My name is Season. Um, I'm currently the director of data engineering. So today I'm gonna talk about Apache Spark and the various ways of running a Spark application. Okay. So before I begin, I have a disclaimer page. Basically, it just means that the view here are my own. So to give you guys some background on why this topic, right? Why Apache Spark is mainly because data engineering is mainly about providing or moving data from one place to the people that uh, needs it. The people can be people from marketing team, can be the data scientists, 
can be the business analyst. And we move quite a bit of data on a daily basis, uh, terabytes of data and a few hundred millions rows of data. So in order to move the data efficiently, so we need a framework that can provide all uh, these points. So high availability, or some people call it self-healing ability, is server goes down, right? So server goes down for uh, whatever reason. So when that happens, we want another machine to be able to take its place uh, so that the job doesn't just fail. Uh, we also want the ability to process big data in a distributed manner, simply because uh, that size of data is hard or near to impossible to, to perform on a single machine. Uh, we also want the framework to be relatively easy to develop and also to maintain. We also want it to be scalable. Uh, so you, at times when we are performing uh, ETLs on certain data site, uh, a data set, so we want to be able to scale. Uh, let's say this job needs like 100 nodes. We want to be able to scale up. And when it is done, we want to be able to scale down as well. And we want the performance as well. We, want, we don't want it to run for a few days, right? We want it to run in a fairly quickly manner. So we look into several frameworks or languages. Um, so the first one is the Python programming language. Um, this is not a framework, it's a language. It's so commonly used in the data science uh, community. So we actually have a bunch of uh, Python script, uh, ETL scripts. Uh, we also look into dbt. dbt is not exactly a framework to do data pipeline, but uh, it can create views that uh, if you have a same data source, then dbt could be uh, sufficient. So we also look into something called Apache Pig. It's uh, a framework that allows you to do ETL, and you will convert into MapReduce, which can run pretty efficiently. And then there's this framework called Apache Spark which is what I'm going to talk about. So Apache Spark uh, meets all the requirements, but it is, um, it's not straightforward to run. If you, expect, if you have experience in it, you'll find, you'll find that there are so many ways to, to execute a, a Spark application, right? So which one to use? So these are the few ways that, um, that we did, uh, some we did not do. There are more than this, but uh, these are the views. So single, you can run your Spark application on a single instance. Um, there's also this simple standalone deployment, deployment mode provided by Spark itself. And if you have MapReduce job, you can run it on Hadoop Yarn. Um, you can also run on Meso, Kubernetes, and EMR. Um, but do note that if you want to run it on Kubernetes, Currently, it is experimental, meaning the way that you're running the Spark application might change as the framework mature. Right, so this is the first way. So if throughout the talk, I will talk about various ways of doing this. This is the first method. So this is just a very simple one. You just run it on a single machine. There's no magic in it. So when you're running it on a single machine, Basically, there's no HA. If the server dies, your job dies, right? <laughs> so, um, and also it's not scalable, obviously. And for the monitoring part, from our experiences, when the job runs, you'll basically just see that it consumes all the CPU and all the RAM. So if you use tool like New Relic, Datadog, or even a simple top command, uh, it's not useful because you'll see all maxed out. And obviously, there will be no queuing system. You can execute more than one job, but you wouldn't know for sure or clearly or easily uh, whether the job is still running, is, has failed, or finished. But in some cases, it does make sense uh, to run uh, a Spark application on a single machine. Um, so for jobs that are ad hoc, meaning you only need the job once, you don't need to create a, a recurring pipeline, uh, ad hoc task. You can run it on the single machine. But this is my personal point of view. If you want to do it on a single machine, your job should not be too heavy. Uh, it should be roughly 
lightweight, like uh, less than 16 gig of RAM, uh, less than four cores, or even the data size is like less than 10 gig. Uh, comparing single machine to a cluster, managing a single machine is relatively easy if you manage a cluster before you will know. And under some case, some use case, it's better to have a HPC compared to a cluster because um, a single HPC can be cheaper compared to a cluster. And this is also from our experience. If your Spark application needs to process some files stored locally on the server, uh, from the code point of view, it's easier to read and write the file uh, that's stored on the server itself. So this is the second method. Uh, the second method is a Spark standalone cluster. Uh, the architecture basically looks like this. You have a Spark client, you have a Spark master, and several worker nodes. So the worker nodes are not three, are not limited to three. It can be one, it can be, ten, it can be 100. So when you run it um, in a standalone cluster, you have, basic, you have basic monitoring, which I'll show a diagram later. You have HA, meaning if the worker node dies, your job will not stop. Um, it will be completed and a, a new worker node can replace it. Uh, same for the master as well. And it has queuing system, meaning you can just schedule two jobs running and it will run sequentially. Uh, it can also scale horizontally. The Spark worker node can just go to 100 and back to 1. Um, you can also specify the resources uh, required via the Spark submit command. So when we, when, we spread, when we set up the standalone cluster, we find that there are several steps that's pretty repetitive. Like you need to download the binaries, you need to untar the binaries, and then you need to set up the configurations. So those are pretty repetitive, right? And you need to do it for uh, Spark Master and then Spark Worker, a uh, few worker nodes. Then one, tr one trick that we use is we use item2. Uh, it has a broadcast feature where you can just type once and it broadcasts all the uh, terminals. So on this uh, standalone cluster, uh, you have basic monitoring, you have queuing system, but the queuing system is defaulted to uh, first in, first out. Meaning if your first job takes 24 hours to run, your subsequent job can only run after 24 hours. And we, this is from experience as well. It's not intuitive to set up. We went through the official guide and it didn't work, not on the first try. <laughs> but I guess uh, you guys can relate. Um, so it took us a while to figure it out. But comparing to all the methods, this one is the easiest. This is the monitoring uh, system. As you can see, it's pretty basic. You, ref, you roughly have like about six metrics, six or seven metrics. Uh, then the metric number three is standalone, but with a framework called Flynn Rock. So what Flynn Rock actually does is, instead of you setting up the master yourself, setting up the worker yourself, you configure one file. You configure one, one single YAML file, and based on the YAML file, you execute the Flynn Rock command and it will do the work for you. So this one is the same as the standalone, right? You only provide the basic monitoring. Um, excuse me. Then um, another thing that we notice is uh, this needs to be on a public network. So if you are doing this, beware because even though it's required to be on public network, you need to provide. You need to protect your uh, network by limiting the IP access. Then you only support um, Amazon EC2. And also, um, when we were setting it up, we noticed that the command doesn't always work simply because Flame Rock sometimes start up faster than EC2 start up, um, making the network port uh, blocked. This is num uh, method number four, is a yarn cluster. So a yarn cluster looks like this, but this is oversimplified. Uh, because the actual one is too hard to draw, <laughs> I got lazy. 
Um, but basically it looks like this, you have a Spark client, you have a resource manager, and you have node manager. So you can have multiple node managers, and within the node managers, you have containers. And within containers, you can have application master or the Spark executor itself. Uh, by the way, YARN stands for yet another resource negotiator, or someone called, or some people call it like Hadoop 2.0. Yeah. So um, how is this is different? It has comprehensive monitoring, which I'll show you guys later. So other than running a Spark application, you can run other technologies as well, uh, such as uh, Pig that was mentioned earlier and MapReduce. Uh, and it's made possible because of the container architecture. Uh, this is the, the monitoring system. A uh, few things that we find useful for us is the node, nodes uh, tab where you will see all the information about the nodes that would help you in scaling the nodes. And the application where you can see all the application that you want to execute or executing. And also the scheduler. Um, this is the scheduler page. See the steady fresh app. It, it's not, it's defaulted. Uh, the default setting was FIFO. We changed it to steady fresh app, uh, meaning at one point we can run more than one job. We don't need to wait for the first one to complete before running more. Um, then we find this one useful as well. Uh, because it helps us understand and monitor the memory usage and assign it accordingly. So comparing to the basic monitoring where you have only six, seven metrics, you get like 40 metrics uh, on one page. A uh, few things to note on the yarn cluster. The, before you do anything, before you run any application, the application master will take away one CPU away from you, so you lose one CPU core. And we find that the uh, resource management system is very complex, but in a good way, it provides us the ability to allocate exactly how much we need. Uh, and then from experience, we find that to figure out what to configure and how to configure is very difficult because by default there's nothing. Uh, this is some example. This is a very short example. Um, let's say on the resource manager, right? There's this key called yarn resource manager scheduler class. You can try to Google it right now. You will not straight away or easily find the answer where uh, fast scheduler is available option. It took us a while to understand uh, what are all the options available, and this is the one suitable for our use case. Uh, another example on the node manager, because Yarn was mainly used for running MapReduce, so, but we are not running MapReduce, we are running Spark. That's why we, it makes sense for us to change to this uh, Spark Yarn Shuffle service. And there are many more, uh, this is just two of the examples. Uh, this is method number five. Basically, it's the same yarn cluster, but this is the hosted version. So it's called AWS EMR, uh, more like managed version. So it's a managed service. It uses Ganglia as the monitoring system. Um, I have no experience in Ganglia, so I'll not talk about it here. Uh, and it's bundled, it can be bundled with other frameworks. These are all the options as of yesterday. A few things to note about this is the versions are limited. Uh, if you set it up yourself, right, uh, regardless whether it's yarn or standalone, you can choose exactly which version of the binary you want to download on par and set up. But if you do it on EMR, there's only a limited options available. And we noticed the Hadoop version is also lagging. As of yesterday, it was only 2.8.5, whereas the latest is 3.1.1. And uh, shutdown option is not available. It's either running or terminate. But what does this mean, right? What is shutdown and how is it different from terminate? So let's say you are a small company that uh, don't do any 
uh, ETL or don't need the uh, Spark cluster after working hours or even the weekend. You can shut it down uh, to save some money. And when you need it, you can just turn it on again. But terminate means that you completely remove it. So if you need it, you have to set it up again. So EMR is either you have it up or you just terminate and set it up again. Um, and if you use this, um, they have, uh, instead of doing the checkbox, uh, they have a preset uh, cluster options available. We try it out, but we find that it's pretty basic. It doesn't fit our use case. And we also noticed that it comes with a yarn configuration, preset yarn configuration, meaning they set the configuration for us already. So without truly understanding what they already set for us, we find that tweaking the configuration is, is a bit hard because if we tweak something, it might cause something unexpected to happen and a cascading side effect. So that's um, all the options uh, that I can share. So I hope the key takeaway that you can take away from this is there are many options available to run Spark application. Uh, each one has their pros and cons. Um, hopefully after today, you can choose the one that best suit your use case. Um, hopefully this diagram will help as well. <laughs> um, one easy thing to pick is whether you need ad hoc or HA scalability to choose these two sides. So when you think you need to be on this side, you can choose whether you want a managed service or a self-hosted service. Right? Then it's easy to choose EMR or maybe even Databricks versus you set it up yourself and maintain it yourself. Um, I think I'll open to questions right now. Thank you. quite a few. Um, I think basically these are the important ones. You have to clearly uh, understand your use case first before you decide that you want to set it up yourself uh, versus uh, a managed service to begin with. So when, if, if you decided to set it up yourself, there are also a few options. Kubernetes, Meso, Standalone, Yarn. Um, then you have to understand which, uh, what are the pros and cons of each one and choose the one that you need. Right. For example, if you have map reduced job, it's pretty easy to choose because Yarn is a suitable one. You can run Yarn and also Spark at the same cluster. Um, if you have a very big uh, Kubernetes already spin up, you might as well just use it. Manage the cost. Um, we will start with minimum, and then we will see whether it uh, can can support what we need. So start with the minimum first, and then we try to run it. So if it if the application fails straight away, obviously okay. If it fails straight away because of not enough memory, obviously you need to add more memory. Maybe use a bigger instance size, or maybe have more nodes. Then to get a better sense on how much your application needs. So running a Spark application, right, it runs on memory. Say you're processing 10 gig of uh, data, you have to at least have like 15 gig of memory, else it wouldn't even make sense to uh, fit into the memory. Uh, 
So you'll have to switch over. Okay, sure. Right. Thanks. Sorry, technical problems. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Let's let uh, let let me introduce uh, the team. Uh, actually, uh, my name is Irhan. I'm a research uh, researcher. Uh, I graduated in uh, 2003. Uh, last time there was no data scientist. It was called uh, industrial research and operation engineering. So there's no data scientist when we were in college. Uh, Faisal uh, is the, the, the founder of uh, Red Ampau. Uh, he does all the tech, uh, tech stacks and data analytics. I do the talking mostly. So yeah. So, that, uh, so I do a lot more pitching these days because we are going to the cradle, we are raising funds and, and, and uh, that sort of thing. So, I speak a lot to investors. I speak a lot to uh, uh, people to, to convince that that uh, my business idea is good, even though that that's actually crap, and I'm selling them dreams really. <laughs> Sorry, this is a no bullshit conference, right? I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, try to be honest. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. So data storytelling, how to gain a return on investment on your data and get love from your management and not hatred. Because usually as a technical person, right, uh, we don't do enough communicating. Uh, we are actually at the back, back room uh, doing data, doing data uh, uh, engineering. Uh, we don't do as much data analytics. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. Anyone doing data analytics at the high-end level? One in the room? I don't know. Five? Okay, sure. So, yeah, see? Great. So, data has latent value. The reason why you collect data is, the, uh, is because everyone thinks it has some form of value. It has some or form of uh, monetary uh, value that you can derive from, either from selling, either from uh, uh, getting enough uh, information for you to decide as call to action. And uh, uh, as, a, as an economist, I use data a lot when I was working for Kazana. Uh, and this is, uh, I mean, it, it's second nature to me. Uh, so your data may may hold amounts of potential value, but sometimes the, the work is is uh, how do we derive the value from it. So what are the arts about about uh, the data? So it's actually uh, okay. It's visualization, the narrative, and the data science uh, of of data that you have. So is there analyst in the, uh, in in the room? Which which industry are you in? I mean, economic analysts, equity analysts, are you? Banks. Banks? SE? Finance. Finance. Ops? Operation? Finance. Finance. How do you communicate your data to your uh, 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 middle management or boss? How do you do that? Do they listen to you most of the time? How do you convert? value from your data and tell your management that, that something is going on. 
I don't know either. <laughs> because what we do is uh, the the the, the, cons co uh, the consumer of our data are basically uh, uh, many levels. One uh, experience our juniors, sometimes generalists, people who speak to us in uh, in uh, uh, at at the general public or managerial that need some some in depth or actionable details and experts sometimes uh, we deal a lot more with experts in in research and also uh, the c suite people who want significance and conclusion yes i spend uh, 3 million dollars building system on your data how do i derive value from it what's the roi can we convince them in in this basically the way you tell story with data is to to, to actually scare people, scare people that they will lose money if they don't do this. That's that's basically what equity analyst does lah, or e economic analyst does. So if you don't do this, GDP will go down by five percent. I don't know. <laughs> or if you do this, then your company will grow by X percent. That is actually how we tell we tell our uh, our data uh, a story with our data. And that uh, is actually connected to feeling, because people don't remember data as much, like five percent, ten percent. I don't know. Does people or does people on the street feel the economic growth? See that these are the the, the, the language that people use when they talk about data. It's always feeling, like six percent growth or two percent growth. Oh oh no, the 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 oil prices going up, the food prices going up. People don't feel the economic growth, but uh, when we are growing at four and all price goes down, people even suffer, uh, suffer a bit more. But they don't feel that way, right? Next, what's the drug of storytelling? Storytelling makes us uh, feel good, right? Okay, feel good about uh, uh, data because uh, this is the, the the chemicals in our brain that that could make us connect with one another. And we use this uh, uh, storytelling to, 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 to convince people. So consider a, a business case, right? This is the data that we collect uh, from the bus routes uh, in, in all of uh, Kuala Lumpur. Sorry, this is uh, the, uh, the map of uh, bus routes uh, in Klang Valley. Uh, consider this uh, as a business case. How do you convince your management that your data tells you a story by like this so you're looking at a, a deeper data by stating the facts but stating the facts usually don't capture enough attention because i mean what am i looking at you, you we are using uh, technical terms like quartile with using technical terms like productive or least productive and what do we do with this data can we decide something so you need to actually craft a business narrative and if we use this data uh, if we do something about this and we can save 15 percent operating costs we can by uh, rescheduling trips uh, you dig a bit more on on this type of data so these are the the, the ways that people talk about data uh, as an analyst so those two things that that we use la, as, 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 as a storyline. One is to create fear or two to create hope. And uh, this is the, the two main things, the storyline that we create. See? Okay, next. What are the good practice? So narrative is important. First, uh, decide on the story that you want to tell. Uh, fear or uh, hope. And then decide the storyline. For example, if this happen, this happen, this happen, X will happen using your data. Or this happen, this happen, this happen, growth will happen using your data. So those are the, the, the key main things. Uh, on it. And then uh, try to reduce uh, cognitive burden. Use very simple words for people to understand. Because sometimes when we are data scientists, we tend to write in a language that people don't use. So people can't understand what we are talking about. To try to reduce the cognitive burden. So when you read, you you use very uh, small, uh, uh, very very simple words. Sorry. 
and be objective and offer balance in the view and don't censor as much. So that's it. Any question? I mean, I know the presentation is not technical as what uh, the, the regular place of uh, data science is. Yeah. Storytelling, right? Yep. And you mentioned that there's a positive and you have, you have to set a narrative, right? You want to make it either positive or negative. Yep. And you want to pitch to your client with which ratio. In your opinion and based on your experience, which has been more effective to show the client the negative aspect if they don't uh, comply or they don't uh, you know, adapt with this data or uh, in a more hopeful way? In your opinion. The, the experience I have uh, with uh, startups, usually we, uh, I, I think, uh, usually uh, I focus on the pain points. So pain points means that the fear about problems. So you pinch on that a bit more. So uh, um, yeah, I know, but yeah, because because humans have a flight. I mean, apa? Fight or flight. Yeah, uh, response then. So. Bila kau nampak macam takut tu, dia, the, the the feeling is slightly more uh, and gives you more attention, so to speak. Because economists, when they they write something, they want to appear pessimist so that people pay attention to them. Yes, unless you are bank negara lah, of course. Yes. I, I think another thing you might want to add to your good practices is to not have a agenda okay. and then shape the facts to, to uh, meet that agenda. Okay. Because many times I've seen the facts don't fit the narrative, but people chew on it and present it disingenuously. And I've seen economists do this, I've seen research bodies do this, it's BS. If you are quantitatively different, you can spot it a mile away. Yep. But the lay person or the person or the decision maker you're trying to influence will not know. Yeah. And sometimes may not be able to be able to critically question that it is dishonest or misleading. You are right. You are absolutely right. So good practice. I mean, you. But okay, here's the problem. You are funded by someone. If you are a research house, you are funded by someone. Which uh, just like you have a job, you are funded by someone. So your views has to to actually take into account some of these things. And yes. Sometimes uh, researchers, uh, data scientists use data to, to actually create certain narratives and tell that that story uh, in the media, in the in the uh, in the uh, journals, uh, in uh, in newspapers, and everything. Next question, yes. Um, how would you describe the iteration process for data storytelling? Uh, data storytelling, uh, you need a lot of uh, repetition just like your, your coding. It's always uh, uh, have a draft, talk to people whether this draft is okay, whether uh, the, uh, the, uh, the flow is okay, whether the storyline uh, jive, and then you test with a lot of people. And uh, as a research analyst, we have, uh, uh, usually we have a discipline of going to your process. So that is the iteration process uh, of data storytelling. If you are a different person, for example, if you are not in the research house, probably you are in in the operation side. Data storytelling is useful to show that your uh, your work matters, because what we want to show, what the agenda that we are trying to to push is actually more data scientists in a lot of organizations, and you as as a, a data scientist, uh, uh, we call professionals need to push that agenda too. Next question. Yes. Do you usually report that the CPM to validate the storytelling? Uh, yes. It, it, sorry. No. So, uh, yeah, we, we use statistician, but not as much. Huh? <laughs> so statistics how uh, okay uh, the, the data that we use sometimes don't require statistician unless it's really huge big data 
that that you are modeling that's different if you are doing storytelling you don't do models mostly you don't do models uh, to, to, to story tell yep next any simpler question yes <laughs> For small, this is not data scientist related. I, I hope uh, this is just uh, storytelling. Uh, for uh, selling to, to smaller customers, uh, usually it's easier for us. For example, uh, you want to sell data to, to our smaller customers, but start, uh, other startups, they have a, a, a problems that they want to solve. So usually they, they just, here's 5,000 ringgit, you solve my problem, then, uh, then, uh, then we go solve. Uh, selling is difficult on, on uh, fear alone. Selling has to be coupled with hope. So this is a problem, here's some hope, pay money to me, and then this is a solution. I mean, at the crudest form, that's, 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 that's what selling is. Uh. That's a value that you bring to your client. Actually, not not this product has so many features. I mean, it has. I mean, ten thousand features. You might, you might, you might, you might be rich with this. I don't know. But what he's looking at is actually probably go to heaven or sell heaven to him. <laughs> Question next. Yes. Yes. I do. Ah, interesting point. Uh, exploring and have an agenda, so to speak, uh, and then uh, feed that data to agenda. Usually, we do both. We do both uh, primarily because uh, in your in, uh, in, as as uh, as a researcher or economist, uh, we look at the data in overall overall uh, uh, data, uh, the landscape of the data. And then uh, we explore some some bits. Whether we find something interesting, then we tell a story. If there's something interesting to tell, we do. The agenda part depends on instructions. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I know it's difficult, but yeah, your question. Yep. So at some point you may, I guess you may fail to convince them that you just the story tell them like and all of that. So I wonder like I mean as an artist, I'm guessing people should be working with facts and story telling, but here we have facts as well. So if, despite everything you're doing, if you fail to convince somebody, how do you take it either? Do you try to push harder or do you just you know, move on, try to Yeah. Do you wanna answer? <laughs> I'll I'll give I'll give the easier question to, to Faisal. Hans Rosling, he, he talks about this point where 
should data be used to, uh, as a call for action, uh, or should it be uh, basically kept as stated facts and it should not be exploited for political agenda? Uh, I think it's more philosophical uh, perspective between what you presented and what you're putting there. Uh, but to a certain extent, uh, by time, people will lose their sensitivity to if the true moment or the call of data or the call of action. action. It might even hurt uh, the credibility of data as in itself as a, a source of, of truth. So, so to some extent, I feel like there is an ethical code when it comes to devising a data level. Uh, but that's just another point. So what, so my question is... Uh, <laughs> no, I agree with your point, totally. I agree with your point. <laughs> How, how do you value, uh, evaluate that? So that, for example, your vocabulary, uh, name and term, uh, your name and term, my name and term might be the same because we work on that level, but we have another person. If it's first for a person, for example, an unexpected person is a person, how do you, and to what extent does it really work through the iteration to evaluate the, the uh, yes, uh, for storytelling, uh, it's, it's, it's practice. Storytelling is about practice. That's why uh, you heard uh, your uh, grandmama's story and you try to repeat it, right? Every, every level of, of uh, uh, generation you repeat that same story again and again and again and again and again. This is exactly the same thing with your uh, storytelling data. You tell that story again and again and again and again. Which means that two things happen. One is repetition. Number two is feedbacks. Storytelling involves a lot of feedbacks. A lot, a lot of feedbacks. I mean, telling story is not easy because connecting people is not easy. It's, it's not automatic. It's, it involves uh, repetition and spending time so that that's what storytelling is to me lah sorry sir that's good no, I think, I think you're done okay, okay. <laughs> thanks a lot my god <laughs>
sorry. Hearing my voice is my voice really weird. <laughs> right. So Digitas is about helping uh, brands connect better with consumers. So we are a different breed in terms of uh, agency. What we do is we believe in true connection and wonder. True basically means everything we do starts with data. Connection is how do we help brands find better solutions to connect to consumers. Always the consumer first approach. And wonder is basically how we apply creativity to bring this all to life. So I mean, guys, if you are interested in applying the data skills, interested in working with brands such as Mercedes, working with um, what other brands do we have? So we have Coke. We have <laughs> guys. Tell me out. What other brands do we have? Samsung. I know. This goes on and on and on. <laughs> so if you're looking to work a brand, looking to kind of work from a brand perspective, how to connect a better consumer, how to solve consumer problems, that's how the chat is. Right. Right. Hello everyone, my name is Nas. I am from Bangalore, Indonesia. So uh, for, the past, for the past two years, the data science unit um, inside Bangalore is pretty small. It's like people but recently we are expanding so we are looking for senior junior and senior data scientists and data engineers um so what have we doing so it's a centralized unit that acts like an internal consultant so we're looking at how can we use data better how do we find out this data do we use met new methods for economic analysis financial stability all that is so whatever i want to mention something related to that Learn more. I cannot see much publicly and on report. Um, so yeah, so um, feel free to contact me. I'll be around hanging with you around. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Before the start of your appointment, how does Ben Megalo make their decision? What are their Please create evidence. No, I can I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> even even if it's private, so I'll be clear. I I cannot see that. But I can only say whatever my team does. Oh, very very diplomatic, right? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, thank you. Alright, so before you wrap up for tonight, um, just want to reiterate again that your feedback is highly appreciated. Um, and you can send your feedback here to the link bit.ly uh, slash WTF Data Council 3 bit.ly uh, slash WTF Data Council 3 I'll use the QR code and for speaker slides here on media.com and I think before we all go, we'd like to have a big group photo um, so can can okay, yeah so let's, let's all gather around for the group photo guys Okay, never mind. I think you all can just sit where you are. We'll just take the picture from me from the front here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 